Technology and Neuroscience. So uh, welcome, Billy. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, apologize for the technical issues. I have no idea what went wrong there, but <laughs> right now everything is set up and running. So um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm having a very warm relationship with uh, with all of you guys, with uh, people in Brno. Uh, I've been there a couple of times, visited the university and can't wait to come back. Uh, Corona, unfortunately, uh, made that a little bit uh, complicated, but um, the nice thing about Corona and the coronavirus was that it made uh, a lot of companies uh, get more digital and get more into digital communication. So I'm very, very glad that sitting over here in central Germany, I can still speak to you and give you a short presentation uh, about the, uh, on the work that I'm doing and the stuff that, that I've been doing for uh, actually quite a few years now. Um, I, what I want to share with you today is uh, basically um, a project that pretty much sums up my work of the last probably 10 to 15 years. Um, and before I want to get into the details, I want to give you a little bit of background information about who am I and, and uh, also why am I giving you this lecture today, uh, especially the way that I'm going to give it to you. So I, I'm, I, I used to be a student of psychology. I studied psychology uh, in Berlin. And back in 2010, so 12 years ago, a very long time ago, um, we did have a project in Berlin that was actually funded with with uh, with money from the European Union to see whether or not it would be possible to use neuroscientific technology for anything else rather than uh, basic research. So really go taking neuroscience methodologies and bringing them into applied research. Um, and that was actually a quite huge project. We were 10 colleagues that were working on that for two years. Um, and now, of course, the world changed. A lot, a lot has become known now about how neuroscience is working, how we can use those things. But back then it was really, neuroscience was really just used for academic research. Well, basically really just for academic research and within medicine. And very, very rarely it was used for other purposes than that. So we had a little department, a little part of our group that really looked into how can we use neuroscientific technologies such as EEG systems, such as near infrared spectroscopy, uh, also fMRI to a certain degree. How can we use those technologies to, for example, diagnose uh, um, psychological diseases? How can we use those if we have professional athletes to really help them to get like the last five, ten percent of their performance? to really bring them to the peak of their performance. Uh, things like that were actually on our agenda to look into those. And back in 2010, one of the, the topics that has been discussed back then quite a lot within the, uh, within the business literature was a term that uh, nowadays also still is very much known. That was the term neuromarketing. So how can we use neuroscience and neuroscience technologies to better understand how marketing is working and to actually improve our marketing. And that was a field that really fascinated me because I'm someone, and you, you heard that in the introduction, I'm someone who's always been, um, I, I always say I'm sitting between two chairs. So the one chair that I'm sitting on is really deeply rooted into business. I really like to bring applications into the real world to try to understand how people make decisions, but, uh, but also to really build businesses on that and really have a practical application of all the stuff that I'm doing. And that is why half of the time, half of my day is really I'm working for Deloitte. Deloitte is a big um, business consultancy acting globally. They have over or we have over 300,000 members within Deloitte globally. And that is why you can see on the slides here down at the bottom left and also in the center of it, you can see the Deloitte logo because everything that I'll be presenting you today has been done um, during my time that I work for Deloitte, which I still do half time. But uh, a year ago, I was still working full time for them. And within Deloitte, we have what we call the Deloitte Neuroscience Institute. That's the logo that you see on the very right. Um, and the Neuroscience Institute within Deloitte is really dedicated to bringing neuroscience into application, bringing it into business and bringing business consultants to the next level of understanding how is the human nature working, how is the human brain working, and how can we leverage those insights into really business applications. 
On the other hand, the second chair that I'm always sitting on is really an academic one. So I'm not only interested in the application of the insights, I'm also interested in generating new insights and really to getting a deep understanding of why do people act the way they act? Why, what makes us human and why do we decide the way that we decide? And I always try to bring those two perspectives together. The project that I wanted to present you today is actually something that I've been uh, talking about recently quite a lot. It's a, actually a business project that is still running. So everything that you'll see is really data that has not been published in an academic way because it's really uh, something that we were we were uh, paid by a client to do the work. Um, and it's something that uh, if I'm not sure if you're familiar with with business consultancies, uh, it's something that the client really paid a lot of money to make that work. I cannot go into the details there, but um, just to give you an example, um, I presented actually a shortened version of the talk that I'm going to give to you now uh, a couple of weeks ago on an international conference, which is called the Neuromarketing World Forum. Um, and there you had to pay over a thousand euros to actually just attend the conference. So, and you uh, basically get that for free now. So um, I hope that you can enjoy it. It's really leaning heavily into business. Um, and I'll show you how we combine neuroscience with business questions to really try to leverage the practical applic applicability of neuroscience and psychology, especially applied psychology. So what am I going to talk to you about? Um, the title actually is giving a lot of it away. Got mail using neuroscience and psychology to increase the effectiveness of newsletter communication. So I'm really focusing on email communication. And if you look into your mailboxes, you get tons of email every day. And when I started um, looking into how can I present what we're doing, um, I looked actually through my own mailboxes and realized that I get probably something between two and 10 email newsletters every single day. Newsletters are something that is used really quite frequently and by almost all businesses out there. And the single reason for that is what you can see here. Newsletters are cheap and easy to use. It really costs basically nothing to send out an email newsletter to the people that registered for it. And even if you just send them out and most of them uh, get into the junk mail and some of them really get into the into the trash bin without being read at all, there is a slight chance that someone clicks on it, reads it through, and then actually follows the instructions within the newsletter if it is done good, um, if it is done well, so that they, you actually, as a business, you actually convert the reader into a customer. So they actually buy something, which usually is the, is the main purpose of a newsletter. Um, just to give you a, a, a little number or, or a couple of numbers there, newsletters, if they send out newsletters, professional big service companies like those, whatever big clients come to your name, whichever big businesses come to your name, they pay per every email that they send out, every newsletter that they send out between two and 30 cents. So it's really cheap to send those emails, uh, those newsletters out. And I'm actually in discussion with a, with a client right now uh, we'll have a meeting next week again. Um, and they said that their newsletters, when they sent them out, uh, roughly 2% of them, irrespective of whom they send them to, 2% of them actually convert. So two, two out of 100 people that receive such a newsletter actually buy something that is listed within that newsletter. So meaning it is really, really effective in terms of communication to send out newsletters, which is why you receive so many. And to back this with, with a little bit more of details, um, if you asked, uh, if you would have asked people that are um, uh, that are responsible for marketing within uh, within big companies, they say that email marketing, so sending out emails to people, is actually the most effective and most preferred method to get in contact with their clients. So by by twenty eight percent, email is the number one channel to communicate. Um, with with customers, irrespective of the of the client, irrespective of the, the the industry that they're in, and that is even more important than social media marketing, which probably is something that all of you are very very much familiar. Um, so email still is the number one uh, channel that companies like to interact with with their clients, and that has a reason. 
if you look at the numbers back, I think those numbers are two years old. Um, every single day, day on a global level, 306 billion, that's with a B in the beginning, so not million, billion emails are being sent out as newsletters every single day. And that really translates into those 28%. Um, and if you average all of that together, based on, on, on the numbers that we do have on that, um, that accumulates to a, an average profit of $42 for every dollar that is spent into email marketing, meaning that is really a great return of invest. So the, the logic that many companies are using is really the more emails I send out, the higher, the more people I will get to actually buy my products. I will come back to that number with the efficiency because that is something that that is basically the the ball mark, the ballpark that we will compare our uh, our approach to. So forty two dollars of profit for every one dollar that I spend in email marketing. So if I have all of that, um, I have to put up a disclaimer here very much in the beginning. As I said, this is a real world use case that is actually still going on. We're in the process of finishing it probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, so I am unfortunately not allowed to show you the real material that we've been using for the client. Um, uh, so what I did instead was I really went through the emails that, that I receive every day and took one of the newsletters that I, I receive on a daily basis or on, on a weekly basis um, and basically used that as a stand in for the real newsletter that we performed all those metrics and analyses on. And this is the newsletter that you can see that I use as an example. So this is really just a stand in. The real newsletter looks completely different, is a completely different brand, completely different company, completely different industry. Uh, you'll never guess who it is, um, but just imagine, okay, this is now the newsletter that we're talking about. Um, just for your background information, I've chosen that one because the NMSBA, that's an umbrella organization that organizes uh, basically everything around applied neuroscience, applied uh, neuromarketing, both from a business perspective and from an academic perspective. And they send out regular emails with events that they're doing, with insights that they're generating, things like that. So I'll use that as a stand in. And this was actually their uh, their email that got sent out, I think, sometime last year, uh, where they started advertising uh, that they will have a big in-person event again, which was actually their 10th anniversary, their their 10th, 10th event um, to to promote neuroscience in in business. So this is what it looks like. You have a big logo at the beginning, and then you have the plain text. And I'll show you what we do to improve that. And I'll show you basically a five-step approach that involves a lot of psychology and a lot of neuroscience to improve newsletters. Um, so first step is optimize the template. So I've shown you how the actual newsletter looks like that they're sending out that we use as an example here. What we use in, in applied neuroscience at Deloitte, and which I also do in my academic research, I like to use neuroscientific technologies to understand if customers or potential customers are interacting with communication materials, with products, with things like that. Um, uh, how do they make their decisions? Uh, how the, um, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? Are they getting engaged? Things like that. And you can use neuroscience, te neuroscience technology to actually improve the overall template, the overall design of your communication. How are we doing that? So um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with EG and eye tracking, but EG and eye tracking are actually the two technologies that I personally use the most to do that type of research. Um, unlike the academic setup that you might know where you have tons and tons of electrodes and little gel to improve the signal quality and things like that, when we do applied neuroscience research, it looks pretty much like the picture that you can see here. So that is an EG system that this young lady is having on her head, even though it more looks like a massage spider or something like that. That's actually a full blown EG system, has just a limited amount of, of channels, but it's a real time, it's capable of doing real time uh, recording of, of electric brain signal basically. 
um, we sit them in their natural environment, whatever that may be. This, in this case, that's an office where she's working. And then we put a laptop or a computer in front of them, have a little eye tracking bar. That's what you can see also on the laptop. Um, put a little eye tracking bar on there. And then we we give them tasks, what they should do. So ideally they, I don't know if they're supposed to shop something, if we're analyzing an, an online shop, we give them the task to shop for a certain amount of products in, in defined categories. And then we track where they're looking to see what is the information that they're processing. And we track the EG signal, the brain capacity that is actually uh, doing the processing um, to really see, okay, what is the effect of the material that they're seeing on their decision-making and motivational processes? So in the end, the question that we try to answer with that is, which elements of the stimuli that they see actually are appealing to them and motivate them to buy the advertised products or to do the action, perform the action that is being requested from them. Um, and if we do that for something like uh, like a newsletter, this is a map, and I I I, uh, I want to say again, this is like the example is completely fabricated. Also, the eye tracking data on that one is completely fabricated. But this is what usually so this is not real world eye tracking data. But if we would look at real world eye tracking data, it would pretty much look like that. So we have uh, these green spots that are sometimes also getting reddish if there's a lot of attentional focus on it. Um, then you can see um, where the gaze has been fallen, so which elements of the newsletter have been looked at, um, and you can see also which of them have been overlooked. So where didn't they look? Where did they lose interest? Or which elements were too much hidden so that they weren't able to spot them? Things like that. And then what we do is we superimpose the EEG data on that to understand what is the effect of the information that people were looking at. And that looks never like this, but I use that as an example to how we actually um, present those results. So usually what we do is on top of the heat map that you've seen, we put in a, what, what is called a gaze path. So you can see numbers here and they're connected with those little arrows. And that means the green dot with the number one on there was actually the first thing that have been see, has been seen by that person. And then the gaze jumps to number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, and so on. And usually the color code that we use for those gaze dots is representing the EG data. And the EG data that we're looking at is uh, in, in, in the academic field, it's called the frontal alpha asymmetry. So that is a score that basically a metric that basically is is informing you about whether or not what you see is motivating you to approach it or motivating you to avoid it. And that's basically all it does. It tells you, is it something that is interesting, appealing, uh, something that really resonates with me and, and puts me into action? Or is it something that repels me, bores me? Uh, something where I say, look, nothing for me, so that I want to move on. That is the signal that we're looking at. And when you talk to business people, what they want to have as a result is exactly this. They want to see that all the crucial information has been looked at, and ideally everything has been positive. And people were like, oh yeah, I love that. I love that even more. Let me buy that. Of course, realistically speaking, that never is the case. And from experience, I can also tell you, it's not even necessary. It's very, very rare that we receive information, irrespective of what the type of information is, uh, where we actually agree with that 100% and are like, okay, I want to have this, this is perfect. Usually what it looks like is something like this. Um, and you can see it's not everything green anymore. There, most of it is actually yellow, which means we're somewhere in between of it's, we're, we want to approach it or we want to avoid it, meaning we're just, attentive and curious and then sometimes there are little green highlights which spark our interest and say hey this is interesting and then sometimes there are also elements which are like ah i'm not so much interested in that and usually it the, the journey either ends with hey this is interesting so i want to continue so i click on some kind of button or do whatever is asked from me in the email um, or it ends somewhere in between with a red dot saying okay look i'm bored of this i'm out of here I search for something else. So this is what we realistically see. 
And the interesting thing that we're interested in then is what can we learn from those types of heat maps with superimposed IO tracking data on them? So for example, one of the things that you will see in, um, in almost every study that we've run using this approach is that people, if you have, have something like a header image, that sets the mood for the rest of the email. So if you have a very human-centered um, human centered image, something where a lot of people are, faces, smiling people, um, then that sets the mood for the rest of the email and people expect it to be something social, something interesting, something warm. If you have uh, some fancy product or something like that, then that sets the tone for the rest of the email and people expect there to be something innovative, something new, something for them to learn, something that is pretty cool, things like that. So the, the, the header image actually sets the mood for the entire email and has the power to make it relevant, to make it personal and make it very emotionally resonating with, uh, with the reader. So header image, even though it's not the most important thing, it actually is the first impression that usually people get from your email. The second thing that we find continuously is uh, if your text in an email gets really long, uh, it tends to get perceived negative because people don't read lots of texts anymore. Um, there is one little um, additional information in that. If you send out emails to people that even before they re receive the email are really interested in the brand, in the company, in the products, then long texts actually have a positive effect because then they want to actually feed their curiosity. They want to get to learn more. But if you send out your email to mass people, just your average John Doe, then try to make it precise and 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 try not to to use too much text because after a while people get bored and just um, skip the email. Another finding that very often is surprising for people: single negative experience actually do not cause bounces or are not that, that serious. So it is okay if something in your communication is being perceived as negative. So. Uh, and you all, all probably know that from your own uh, from your own experience. If you click through something and you realize, huh, that's strange, it actually can even uh, fuel your uh, your engagement with it because you want to disagree. You want to actually uh, take the opposite position or something like that. So if you have singular events that are perceived as as being negative, um, that is okay. Uh, it's just important that it's not too much, and it's important that there are basically elevated to something positive in the end. And then there are some insights that we generate generate on a continuous basis that if any one of you wants to build a business in the future or wants to send out email newsletters for your Instagram account or whatever, um, those are things that, that uh, actually turn out true in almost all ways and all forms of communication. So things like if, uh, first of all, do have a call to action because people, if, if you don't have a call to action, people read your email or read your post and then go on. Uh, so ask them to do something with the information that they have. And where, wherever you do that, try to make it popping out. In increase the contrast, make it really easy to spot and re really easy to see that that is where people are supposed to act. Um, secondly, I talked a little bit about, about text length. Um, making bullet points with just the like two, three, four most important points about your argument, about your your post, whatever it is, um, is something that really helps people to quickly grasp the gist of your idea and makes it much more easier for them to understand the email. Um, if your email gets longer, extra images can really help to maintain the mood that you have within the email and actually can make it, uh, help you to maintain the attention of the reader. So the longer your email gets, although the more text you need to, to uh, put into your email, um, the, the more often you should use additional images to just lighten it up a little bit. And then one thing that um, businesses actually have quite a hard time to, to doing that, ideally, if you send out a message, focus on one message only and try not to cramp everything into one email because the chances are that most of it won't get read anyways. And if the email just looks like a, a very long thing, um, uh, that is something that, that repels people also. So make it short, make it precise, try to focus yourself and limit yourself to one message.
So um, if we use all those insights, um, what I did here is I took the, the template that I, uh, or the email that I received and basically filled it into a template that follows those guidelines that I just showed you. Like when we have the EG and eye tracking data or the analysis and we have those insights, what would that mean if I put them to practice? It would mean that something like that might be the result of it. So you have a header image up up on the on the top where a lot of people are in there that sets the mood. So it's something something to celebrate. It's happy, happy people. There are a lot of people, so it seems to be very social. Um, then you have a short text with highlight on the on the most important points. Dear Benny, that's me. It's time to celebrate, which again uh, picks up the notion of the image. When is it time to celebrate? On February the second. Uh, so those are, those are the, the key insights here. And it's really just four lines of text, so really quick to to read. And then you have a call to action that is really in the center of it. That's really highlighted. There's the blue background so that you can basically not miss it. And it just says click here to register free for our free celebration event. Um, so it pops out. It's really really easy to spot. You just can not click on it. And then if you're not convinced at that point, then again, there is the most important highlights of that session. Meet like minded people. Find out what we have in store for you in 2020. Be the first one to know the location of our new conference. Um, that in bullet points and because the email gets a little bit longer an additional image on the side again focusing on the social interaction there's a friendly looking guy on there um, so that that is something how you can uh, compose one email one message really everything pushing you towards to okay click on that thing to register for the event that is what those insights would look put into action um, as i said this entire thing follows uh, this this serves as a template so if I want to continue with that, of course, I don't want to send out the entire email uh, every time the same exact same way. Um, that is why we put, oh, sorry. That is why we use that as a template. So we, um, when, when we have the next email, of course, we replace everything, like the images, we replace the content and then put in the content that we need next. And there's actually a smart way to do that. And to make your, communication your email newsletter effective what you want to do is you want to make it relevant um, relevant means i want to make sure that the people that read it actually get some some sort of value out of it by reading it and in order to be able to do that in order to, to provide value what i need to do is i need to understand what is it actually that my my customers perceive my readers perceive as being valuable um, and that is where psychology comes into play. So I, I've shown you how to use neuroscience methods to optimize the template. Now I want to show you how to use psychology uh, to really understand um, how to communicate and how to create relevance. Um, so this is where I have to, um, to be a little bit, I'll, I'll need a little bit of time to explain what, what we're doing, how this is working. So what you can see here, um, is what we call the Deloitte Need Sphere. Need Sphere is the name because the shape of it is a sphere, and it is a, basically a map of very fundamental human needs. Things that each and every individual, each and every person in the world finds attractive to a certain degree. Um, the map itself is structured, I'll, I'll just guide you through it, is structured in four uh, what we call clusters, so those four quadrants, stability, dominance, bonding, and autonomy. And those are basically the four guiding principles um, that are very important for uh, human approach motivation. So humans in general uh, are uh, feel appeal to feel appeal towards stability. If things are predictable, if things are safe, if things are uh, done accurately, things like that. That is something that is very interesting for some people. Um, people are also drawn towards dominance, like people that portray strength, that portray leadership, that show great performance. That's the reason why a lot of us really love to watch professional sports, because there are athletes that really push the limits of what we think is possible. Um, and also status plays a role. Then we have the, the autonomy cluster, 
There are a lot of people who really love it to have some thrill, some freedom of choice, do what they want, uh, experience some adventure, um, uh, and always learn something new. So, so basically, um, uh, try themselves out, uh, getting in touch with new things. And then, of course, there's the big category of bonding, social interactions. Um, we, we really, if we're in the right mood, we love to socialize. We love to connect with other people. Um, we love to care about other people and to protect the ones that we love. So there's also the social cluster. Those four clusters, as you can see, are divided into four individual within each cluster. So overall, we have 16 needs. That is something that actually came from some research that we did. Um, there, there are, of course, more basic human needs, but, but with those 16, you have a very pragmatic set of needs that can help you to differentiate people, differentiate their needs, um, while at the same time not missing out important extra information. And the crucial thing here is that people actually, what we can show, and there, that there's really a lot of psychological backing, backing behind that, people differ with regard to how they value these individual needs and these clusters on the need sphere. So as an example, and I'll give you further examples later on, there are people, and most people are like that, like that actually, if you ask them what is more important for you to have a high status or to be among your friends, they will choose the friends. So this bonding cluster with all those social needs, that is actually for most people, that's the most important one. But there are other people that actually would say, I don't care about friends, I don't care about people, give me that status, make me important, make people look up to me, and then I'm fine. So they value dominance over the bonding dimension. And the same is true for all the others. There are people who value stability over everything else. There are people who value autonomy over everything else. The critical question is, if you are a business and you want to advertise your services or your products, if you have a, an audience, a target group, what is it that they actually value? Irrespective of your products, what is it that they want, what they want to, to get from you as a company, um, what is driving their behavior basically? And what we're doing is we, we have this map and we have a little online test, which takes basically three to four minutes um, that we can send out to target audiences of communication and really have them, uh, basically it's, it's really easy. It, it pops up one of those needs in the middle of the screen and then they're just asked, is this important for you? Yes and no. And we're looking whether or not they're saying yes or no. And we're looking at how fast are they making that decision? Because what you can, what you can show, and you probably all know this from psychological tests like the implicit tests of association, um, the, the stronger a concept is in your head associated with another concept, the faster you are able to respond to that. And we're basically just using that effect to, to measure actually whole target groups, uh, on, on map them on the need sphere and get an understanding of what is actually driving their behavior, what is driving their, their decision making. So after I introduce the need sphere to you, um, uh, what I want to show you is that we can actually use that to improve the quality of communication. We can, as one step, we can use that to understand um, what is the general need structure within your target group. But if we have that need structure, as I said, people differ with regard to their needs. We can use that to actually make clusters of customers, segments of customers, that are very similar with regards to their need structure. And we can use the information that the company, our clients do have about their customers to basically predict those, uh, those clusters. And I'll show you how that is being done. So as I said, I'll give you some examples uh, about how the need sphere is working and why we need the need sphere or, or some psychological model of, of decision-making. And um, usually, if you talk to businesses, they have a rough description about uh, of what their their customers look like, what they are. And I brought to make it easy for you, I brought a very, very narrow target group with me. So 
imagine your business and your target group is male. So we don't care about females. We only care about males. We only care about males that are 73 years old. So there are not that many that are exactly 73 years old at that moment. They have to be born in winter. So screw all that spring people and those summer people. They're way too happy. We just want to have people who are really depressed born in winter. And because we don't want to spend too much money on marketing, we only want to have them living in London in the UK. So that way we have a very precise target group. Um, because we want to sell them something really extraordinary, expensive, they have to be multimillionaires so that we don't have to care about how much money they spend. And uh, because ideally they get, um, uh, because we want to have some, some public marketing side effects, we want them to be people of public interest. So whenever they are spotted with our product on a picture, we can actually use that to further advertise our services. Um, just to have some side facts, they can be, they should be married with children. That's nicely. And just to give it a fun and a, like a fun twist, uh, we like our target group to be falsely referred to as Prince. You would say there's probably only like one, two, maybe three people in the world, or in this case in London, that actually fit all of these criteria. So for businesses, that is something where they say, okay, look, I really know my target group really, really well. So I know how to communicate with them. And the argument that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to make is you might know your audience with regards to where to get them, and you might know your target audience with regards to how to identify them, but you don't know why they make certain decisions. And even with such a narrow target group, with, so, with such a precise description, you have people like now King Charles, who probably are very conservative, have a very strict lifestyle, very structured. And you have someone like Ozzy Osbourne, who's called the Prince of Darkness, who is basically from those demographics, the exact same person. But I bet you that the things that Prince Charles, sorry, King Charles uh, finds appealing and attractive probably are in no way attracting to Ozzy Osbourne. And that is why you need something like the need sphere to differentiate the why. Why are they buying your products? What is it that they actually do want? You don't need to, you need to know where they are. You need to know how to find them, but you definitely need to know why should they buy your product? And that is where the need sphere comes into play. So what do we do? Um, if we have a business, if we are a business, we send out the little needs for test that I showed you and send it out to um, basically a, a representative sample of your target audience, of your target group. They click through this five minute test and then we receive their needs for profiles. And then we use those needs for profiles to, to create on a statistical level sub segments. So, on the very left, you have the needs sphere for the entire target group, and you can see that things like freedom, things like closeness, things like leadership, discipline, overall in your target group seem to be a little bit more important than other things like, for example, status or variety. But if you look at the data, and if you run a cluster analysis on that, you might be able to spot that there are people that are really not into leadership and status, but in, instead value things like performance, adventure, and freedom as their most important needs. And then there are other people within your target group that say, I don't care about freedom so much. For me, it's more about order. It's more about accuracy. It's more about safety. Um, and then you have on the bottom, a third target group maybe that really leans heavily into the social elements like sociability and closeness, but with this safety touch maybe also. Um, so depending on who your customer is or who the, the business is that you're running, you might end up with something like maybe even just one target group, but you also might end up with like five, six, seven sub-target groups that really have a distinct uh, profile within their need sphere. And what you then can do is you look into the demographic data that you also collected wisely, um, and you'll realize that you'll find certain traits maybe that you can use to describe them. So for example, I'm getting back to the, to the email newsletter that I presented initially. Um, 
those neuroscience events with uh, conferences, those might be appealing to people that are uh, businessmen, businesswomen, because they think, okay, I can use neuroscience to leverage my own business. And for me, of course, performance is the most important thing because I need to cater my, bus my business. Then you have people that are scientists, people like you, people like me, who go there and say, look, it's cur I'm curious, I want to know more about how to apply neuroscience uh, in, in other fields rather than basic research. And those are people who tend to be very, uh, who, who tend to value order and accuracy and want to really get into the nitty gritty details of everything. And then since we're advertising an event, you also might have the people that are just networkers that go there to cater their network, to meet new people, uh, to really just have someone to talk to and, and, and broaden their network. Those are the ones that you probably can identify due to their social traits. Again, those are just examples, but um, I think you get the idea of why it is important and how you can or what you can do with that. So we do have three meaningful clusters now, three meaningful segments. The next question is, what do we do with those segments? And the answer is pretty easy. We take the email newsletter, the, the template that we created, and tailor it towards those three segments that we just identified. Now, what does that look like? Again, we do have this newsletter that we where we used all the neuroscience technology that we have to basically, um, I'm exaggerating a bit, but create a the, the best newsletter that we possibly can come up with. So that's that's that structure. And then what we do is we take out everything that is uh, that can be personalized. So the header image can be personalized. The text in the intro can be personalized. The call to action can be personalized. Uh, mood pictures can be personalized. The benefits of your product are the core of what needs to be personalized. Because why do I buy a product? Because it's valuable for me. What is value, valuable for me? Well, those things that we identified in the need sphere. So we have a template. And then what we do is we fill that template with information, with images that are specific for the segments that we're targeting. So um, if you have, I'll, I'll just do the, do the example in the middle. If you are a scientist and you really want to get into the nitty gritty details of everything and um, you want to uh, have something that is uh, like understand the technology and things like that, then you can use images that actually strike curiosity, that show technology, that show you all the things that you can learn there. Um, you will, uh, in, in the call to action, you use phrases like click here and learn more. So tailor it towards their curiosity. If you have the bullet points that actually focus on the key advantages that you have when you go there, it's something like meet collaborators. So not networking, but meeting people that you can collaborate with. Uh, learn about our plans. Again, learn something new for yourself. Be the first to know the location. Uh, really have that advantage of being the first to have that knowledge. So you can actually use those needs and build the entire structure of your communication, the content, the wording, the images, you can build them around those individual needs and this way build personalized newsletters. So we've gotten from one newsletter for everyone to three different newsletters, all personalized with individual, con uh, individual information in them, even though we're advertising the same product the entire time. So what's the next step? Um, the problem I have now is we know that we have a target audience. We know that that, that that target audience has different individual needs that we clustered into three groups. We created an email template that we can tailor towards those three groups. The important question now is how can I actually find out if I send an email to someone, which segment he or she falls into? So who am I actually addressing? And that is the fifth and last point of the journey um, of personalizing email efforts. Um, the question is, if I get a new someone new into my database, um, which segment does he or she fall into? Can I predict that? And what we did is we built a predictive model to exactly do that. So we, as I said, we ran a needs here study on the population, this is now, uh, since the study was done in Germany, this is the German population. 
Um, we collected the needs for data. And what I already mentioned is, <coughs> excuse me, um, what I already mentioned is we also collected demographic data, sociographic data. So all the data that we could get from those people that is also available to our client, to the business, we collected that from the people that we also have the needs for profile. So if we have that, we can use that to, uh, we can not only use the need sphere to build the three segments that we're looking for, we can also use the demographic and social graphic data to actually predict those three segments. So those are things like the email address. So for example, if you register for an event using your business email address, the business actually tells you quite a lot about what type of personality is going there. If they're registering from a university, chances are actually quite high that they fall into the scientist category. If they're registering from a business account, it's, it's not unlikely at least that they come with a business purpose in mind. Gender actually plays a huge role. I was actually quite surprised how big of a role it plays um, because what we can find is that on average, and again, those are average uh, predictions, on average, women tend to be more social than men and men tend to be more on the dominant side of women especially when you look at the at the extremes like the extreme social people tend to be women the extreme dominant people tend to be men so if we have that information about which gender it is and we just get that by the the first line of the email dear mr or dear mrs tells us which gender that we need to address so that is something that we can use to actually predict uh, um, which segment they fall into. Years of membership within the organization. I told you the NMSBA is an umbrella organization that, that brings together people with those interests. And if you are someone who's in there for quite a long time, that means you probably, uh, you probably value stability, a certain degree to stability at least. And then one of the things that actually shocked me the most when we did that the first time was the zip code. So the region that you're coming from actually tells you a lot about what personality personality type you are. But when you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. And I'll try to publish a, a study next year just on basically that topic. Um, if you uh, think about what determines personality, let's, let's stick with personality for a moment. What determines personality? Probably the two most important factors are, of course, your parents, meaning your genetics, but then also the environment that you're in has a huge impact on how you behave and how you decide. And how can we easily decode the environment that you're living in? Well, through your zip code. Where is it that you're living? Are you living more in the city or in the suburbs or out in the country? Is it a rich area? Is it a poor area? Those things tell you a lot about the personality and the things those people value. This is not deterministic, of course, like we will never get to the point that with those types of data that we can actually make a 100% prediction of which category does an individual fall into. But using something like machine learning, in this case, we made a random forest analysis. Um, we were actually able to predict those three segments with up to 80% accuracy. So there, there's an 80% chance that whenever we have someone new getting into our da database, that we actually allocate him to the correct segment. And that is actually quite huge because it means that only in 20% of the cases, 20 to 25% of the cases, we're sending out the wrong email. Um, so that, that was something that we were actually quite proud of. And it actually does have a huge effect. And that is what I want to tell you about now. As I, as I told you, this is a project that I've been working on basically uh, for pretty much exactly a year now. And we have the client in Germany that has gone through all those five steps that I just told you. Um, and we have been sending out emails for that client every single month since beginning of this year. Well, actually, end of last year, actually. Um, We've, we've been sending out tens of thousands of emails every month um, and we've been targeting those people and sending out three different versions of the same content targeted towards the people based on our needs for predictions. And what we were able to do is, um, based, since we knew who received those emails, 
we were able to target whether or not they opened the email, whether or not they clicked on the call to action, and whether or not they actually purchased the service that was advertised within the email. And that is what I want to show you now. So um, what we did is we always sent most of the people received really the targeted, we call it neuro optimized customer group. They really received the targeted um, uh, communication material. But we also always, every single month, we took out several thousand people that just received the old standard email that they received before we tried to personalize it. And um, that is something that, uh, that we were able to analyze. So we compare the neuro-optimized group to the control group that received a standard email. And after tens of thousands of emails that we've sent out, we saw that the conversion rate, meaning did they actually click on the link within the email increased by almost 25%, 23.4% using personalized communication. The turnover rate, meaning did they actually, within the, the, the website that they landed on, did they actually continue their journey there and actually, uh, well, let's say purchase the service that was advertised, increased by almost 30%. And now I'm getting back to the beginning. You remember that I said uh, newsletters are used so often and are loved so much by businesses because they're just so effective. You spend $1 and you get $42 in return. Well, turns out in our case, as it was in Germany, we, we calculated in euros. This is not calculated per euro spend. But that means for every email that our customers sent out before we did the optimization, they received 96 euros in return. So one email, which costs a couple of cents, they received almost 100 euros back. So the thing that we optimized already is in the very, very top shelf of email effectiveness. They made a huge amount of money per email. And we, through this personalized approach, we were even, uh, we were able to even top that again by almost 20, by more than 27%. So now for every email that they send out with a personalized approach, they get on average 122 euros. So almost 30 euros, 25 euros more than before. And those are actually real numbers. So th this is the only thing that I didn't fake in this entire thing. So this is why we're very convinced that the, the, this approach of using neuroscience to increase the effectiveness of the material and using psychology to actually increase the perceived value of the products that are being advertised has a huge impact on marketing and on communication. Um, I want to give you a little um, extra that, that also happened this year. Because as I said, we started sending out those emails uh, basically last year, so beginning of this year. Um, and uh, I told you in the very beginning that one of the things that companies really have a problem with is when you tell them, look, really focus on one message alone. Because what they say is, look, I'm sending out an email, then let me just, they, I know that they're reading that, I know that they're clicking on something, then let me at least add another extra, like a little upsell is what they call so you know that from Amazon, you're, you're on your website, you have your product, and then down there is other people also bought this stuff. So you're trying to add something to the shopping list so that they do something extra. Um, and if you have an email structure like that, and as you can see, I also inserted the email that we have here, then you have the problem that if you add too much at the bottom of it, after a while, the risk is really high that they don't respond to the actual call to action that was was important for you, but that they just get lost somewhere else and then the 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 entire email loses its effect. Secondly, um, uh, and you are a very young audience, so you know that way better than I do. Who need who reads emails on a laptop nowadays? So if you have a uh, if you do an EEG eye tracking study as we do it, we usually do it on a laptop because they have more performance and because it makes it easier for us to analyze the data afterwards. But if you really want to have a realistic setting and really know how realistically those emails are being perceived, everyone reads their emails on the smartphone nowadays, or at least most people do. So. Um, 
we had the challenge that our customers said, look, we love your email approach. We see how it is working. We want to add a second product that we advertise in that. And it's very important that the first service that we're advertising is getting seen because that's the most important thing. But we want to get give them a little extra and hope that they also click on that. But they have to click on the first one. That's very important. The first one is a must do. The second one is a nice to do. So what we did is um, we we programmed different versions of the newsletter and I didn't prepare because those are getting really so deep into the into the client that I didn't prepare a mock-up for that. But just imagine that underneath the normal email, um, you'll have like an extra module with a product. And um, we sent those out and um, we asked people to use their smartphone to read those newsletters. And the cool thing is nowadays, the technology is so advanced that you don't need an eye tracking bar anymore. You can actually use your uh, camera on the smartphone to, use, to do eye tracking studies. So we sent out a couple of, uh, I think it was a couple of hundred, I can't remember exactly, uh, a couple of hundred of those emails and used the eye tracking, uh, the camera on the smartphone to, to see where are people looking on the newsletter and then from those people, we also collected the data of whether or not they clicked on the call to action. So the primary one, the must have one, whether or not they saw the additional um, call to action. So the second one, the secondary one, and whether or not they also clicked on that one. So if they really got back into the email and clicked on, on, on the other one as well. And um, we actually tested four different designs. And as I said, I'm not allowed to show you the designs. But those are the results that we that we got. So as you can see, let me guide you through that. We have four versions, four different designs, four different styles of how to add the secondary element. And then the first two bars, oh, sorry, I can I think I can, no, I can't do a laser pointer. Um, oh, I can do a laser pointer. Uh, so the first two bars always represent the uh, the important call to action, so the main call to action, the second two always uh, represent the additional call to action. And then the first of the two ones always uh, represents, has it been seen? The second one, has it been clicked? Has it been seen? Has it been clicked? And of course, uh, you have to see it in order to click on it. So the second bar always is lower than the first bar or uh, maximum at par. In this case, they're always lower. And we look at the percentage. So how many of the participants that we had in percent actually saw it and clicked on it. So up here is 100%. And as you can see, version C and version D were the two versions where the main call to action actually still was seen by everyone, clicked on by at least a lot of people, and version uh, and uh, uh, the the secondary one was seen in this case in version D again by everyone and actually the effect was that in version D they clicked more on the secondary than the primary one. Um, so those are information that can actually help you to, to decide whether on like which design do we want to have just based on eye tracking data and then as I said we also um, asked people to basically do a subjective rating of how much do you like the design that you're having right now and they're also version D performed actually best problem with with version d is actually that as i said the additional call to action actually is clicked on more than the primary one so i think if i remember correctly in the end they implemented version c because they wanted the most of the attention on the primary call to action um so this is this is a way how you can use really uh, modern technology to to do those types of study and to actually leverage those um and with that, I actually want to end the the insights that I'm uh, that I've gave you. Um, the I'll, I'll end with the statement that I had in the beginning, uh, where I moaned a little bit that newsletters are used because they're cheap and easy, and that is the 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 uh, basically the the reason that most companies will give you why they use newsletters. Well, it is very cheap to use them, and it's very easy to use them because it's a completely digital service. So they only tell you the content that they want to have and everything is sent out automatically. They have no hurdles, no, no, they don't have to bother with anything at all. 
Um, but if you use, and that's what I hope that I showed you a little bit, if you use psychology, if you use neuroscience, uh, well, newsletters can also become fucking awesome. And it's really an effective tool to convince people um, that your services as a company are worth having a try. And with that, I am done with my presentation and I'm very happy uh, to take some questions if there are any. I just have to get rid of that laser pointer. So. Thank you so much for the presentation. I think it was really interesting to see what kind of research are you doing uh, and which interesting methods you use to gain some uh, data about your uh, users. Uh, so there are actually uh, two questions in the chat, so I will read them for you. And also mm -hmm. the others, uh, you have time to think about your own questions if you have any. So uh, the first question is, um, is the time spent on newsletter key factor of efficiency? If so, is higher time spent positive? So yes, I believe it was uh, like, <laughs> Like when you talked talked about efficiency of the of the newsletters. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's actually a quite good question. It's it's not so easy to answer because um, the the time that you spend on a newsletter is a um, is a predictor of interest in the content of the of the newsletter. Um, it does not necessarily mean that it's efficient um, because the the um, if if you look at it from a business perspective, newsletters are getting sent out to um, to convert, to generate customers, so that you actually buy whatever is advertised within the, in, within the newsletter. And having them uh, look longer on the on the content that you have in the in the newsletter does not necessarily mean that they convert better. Um, it is um, let, let me think how to phrase that. Um, it's not a bad thing if people spend a lot of time on your newsletter because it means that they're really interested in what you're what you're trying to tell them. Um, but there are very like also the example that I showed and 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 some of the things that that we've done uh, in, in in business applications. Some of the newsletters that we have are really really short. It's like I don't know 150 words or something like that. So you can read them within probably less than a minute. Um, and they convert really, really well. Um, but we also have seen uh, it, it really depends a little who is your target group. So um, if if you take the approach that most businesses actually take, most businesses really try to say, okay, look, I send out hundreds and thousands of emails, and then one, two, three, four percent of those will convert. So if I have, let's say, ten thousand emails that I send out, uh, is twice as good as having five thousand emails sent out. So that's the logic with, with with which they're operating. If you in in case of in, in the case that I've shown you with the NMSBA newsletter, those tend to be rather long. Those they, they tend to have a lot of content in there, and they can do that because the audience that they're sending those to is hand picked. So the the audience that that registered for that newsletter actually is very much invested and very much interested in the contents that they have to, that they have to 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 give you or to, to deliver. So they actually pro they probably would even be disappointed if the newsletter gets too short. So if you have fans of your company that really are invested in your company and are really interested in your company, your your newsletters can get really long and it doesn't make make a difference. But if you are taking a mass approach where you really try to to reach as many people as possible, um, I would even I would even tend to the to the other extreme and say the shorter the better. Because um, after a while, people just lose interest. Thank you for the answer. Uh, there's another one. Uh, I will read it for you. How did the smartphone eye tracking experiment work? Did the people have a special app installed that would get our data? Can, can you repeat that? Because I think I didn't get the question right. There was some. Yeah, sorry. Some, uh, how did noise. the smartphone eye tracking experiment work? Uh, did the people have a special app installed that would get our data in the smartphones? Uh, which which how, experiment? How was, 
How was the mm. smartphone eye tracking, Sterling? How were the uh, eye tracking? The smartphone one, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. The smartphone experiment, um, we, so the, the, um, uh, basically, the um, in, in the slides you'll see there's a little logo added to that. It's called Oculit. That's a company based in Berlin. They they actually uh, built that service. So you can, if if you're interested in doing that, you can actually participate as as a subject in their studies. If you go to I think it's Oculit.com. I'm, I'm not sure though. Uh, you can register as a participant there. And um, so from from the from the vendor side of things, how it works is. Um, you basically set up a little study in an online dashboard where you put the stimulus that you want them to look at and um, you, you, you put it up there as an HTML basically so that it can be read by the smartphone. Um, and then uh, participants have to download their app, uh, the Oculit app, and then they, uh, uh, they have to calibrate their eyes on the smartphone. So there's, there's basically a standardized process through that. Uh, you click on some things, you look at some things, then uh, then it registered the quality of your eye tracking data. And then you get presented with everything that the company set up in the online dashboard. Or you get, present that, get that presented on your smartphone. They track your gaze. And after each trial, you can also ask them a number of questions. Um, so for example, the, the, the liking rating that I showed you, um, that was just a simple question of on, on, from one to five stars, how much did you like the newsletter that you just saw? And um, what we did was, I, I, I can't remember exactly the numbers on to how many people we sent that out, but I think it was in the three digit numbers, so more than a hundred. We had those, um, we set up uh, um, online, we set up those four different uh, newsletters um, and those then we, we recruited participants um, to to basically download the app and then uh, uh, look at those, uh, basically perform the task. So read the newsletter and and perform the uh, either like click on whatever you want or don't click. Um, and uh, do, doing that, we recorded the eye tracking. So that that was basically how it was set up. Okay, there are more uh, questions uh, coming from chat. Uh, next one is uh, what kinds of data can we get a total given the technical restriction of email, technical restrictions of email? I don't know if maybe How much? Uh, like do, do, do you understand the question or maybe do you need any more? I, th I think I do understand the question. Um, okay. So there, there's um, there's different. It, it really depends strongly on um on how the technical setup by the provider is being done so um usually what you get from from every email that is sent out so what, what what's tracked whenever you're doing like whenever you click on an email what is being tracked is did you open the email that is something that that the, the uh, email provider can see afterwards did you click on the call or on which links within the email did you click um and then usually also what actions did you perform after that so for example if you receive the i'm just making up some example now if, if you receive an email from let's say amazon or some some other online retailer um, they actually get a, a a muted feedback whether or not the, you opened their email so that is some information that they can use to optimize their emails um, they can usually see if i remember correctly if you scrolled through the email that is information that they get and they get information on what which links did you click in that email because they see where you land in the end um, with this specific pro project um, uh, the, so this is part of actually a really huge project um, the, the things that i showed you are just basically the tip of the iceberg we did a lot of, of additional stuff with that client and um, uh, so, for example, one of the things that that they also do is they have their own app where you can uh, use their services through the app and inf like get information about their services and stuff like that. Um, within those apps, they basically see everything that you're doing, like ev every single information, everything, every step that you do. Uh, they get feedback on that usually. Um, 
So there is the, 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 the digital footprint that we're leaving is actually enormous. Um, there's also one one other thing that is uh, that is completely not related to that study, but w which is really interesting. Um, if you want, like, I assume lots of you do have, probably not all, but lots of you do have a Google account. Um, and Google is very much known for collecting uh, like tons of user data. And if you want to get shocked by how much Google actually knows about you, so the first thing that you can do is um, you have to Google it yourself because I forgot the, the, the link to it, but Google actually gives you access to the data that they collected about you um, if you log into their, their, their service. Um, and it's, it's really your, your entire search history for if you're logged in with your user account while searching um, for like probably even decades long. So th they have all of that stored. Um, and what is really uh, amazing is that if you continue to just browse while you're logged in into Google, um, especially when you use Google Chrome, there was a certain time, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're not allowed to do that anymore, but there was a certain time where they actually tracked everything that happened within their browser. So when you were logged in into your Google account using Google Chrome, they actually saw if you were on websites that are not even controlled by Google. So um, uh, the digital footprint that, that we're leaving is really extraordinarily high uh, up to the degree that those Google data that Google collects can actually be used to predict customer behavior, predict personality, things like that. I have a colleague over here in Germany who's really basically doing um, uh, lexical research uh, on, on like how people speak and he can predict things like what would you say next or, or what like which words would you use in a phrase or uh, also your personality, like your big five personality traits, just based on your Google search history. So, so the digital, uh, the digital information that we get is actually really, really rich. Okay, thank you very much. Another question: Do you have data about reading emails on smartphone? It's interesting for me because the laptop seems to be easier and faster to respond, especially for longer emails. Um, I don't know uh, what data, data on. I don't know. Maybe Marketa, if you want to, uh, you know, like uh, maybe rephrase the question. But I don't think Marketa is online anymore, so okay. I don't think we we will get we we'll get that. Um, Just, I don't know. Maybe can you read the question meant, again? That was. The... Um, yeah, maybe she meant like data actually about the usage of of the smartphones for reading emails. The question was, do you have data about reading emails on smartphone? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's we have... interesting for her because laptop seems to be easier. So maybe it was surprising for her that actually you said that uh, we mostly read emails on our smartphones. I have unfortunately. The, the question seems to get worse again. <laughs> I don't understand much, um, but I, I can I can try to give to give some answers. So um, some of the things like what what you what you do get if if an email like like some more context about the data that we get, um, and I'll, I'll just make it broad so that you get get a bigger picture of of everything. So uh, one of the things that I forgot to mention is when you open an email. Usually, the the company that sent you the email gets information on which device you were opening the email, so uh, which which browser, which email client, and also if you're using a smartphone, what type of smartphone. So one of the things that I can only recommend to you is when, uh, for example, when you're doing online shopping, uh, and you do have a a Apple smartphone, an iPhone. Uh, Either do it incognito because then they don't send those information, or don't use the Apple iPhone because um, a lot of companies use the information, especially like when you book tra travel. If you use the uh, they use the information, which device did you use to access that data, and your pr the price that you get updates based on the, the the device that you're using. So, for example, it is known that uh, Apple uses, especially of uh, uh, iPhones, um, when they book travel, uh, um, uh, th th their travel lodgings through the smartphone, they pay, they pay an extra fee 
just because they used an Apple iPhone, because the company that, that sells that knows that. Um, we usually don't use those types of data because um, we don't need them. Uh, the data that we use, it really like the, it, it really depends a lot on the project that we're that we're on and the the things that we want to to get to know. Like for example, with the 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 projects that I've shown you, um, the client actually did have uh, because they have a rather long relationship with their customers, um, and it is an industry where where a lot of contracts are involved. They get a lot of like contracts. Whoops. You just got stuck a little bit, <laughs> but just for okay. just a very very short moment. Now I'm back so again. You can just go on. Now I'm back again. So I, I'm not sure where you lost me. That that, that was one of the ten second things uh, that I mentioned in yes, the beginning. Sorry for that. Ago. Yeah, no problem. Like I think just a few seconds ago, like you can just go on. Okay. Cool. So yeah, we we usually don't use those smartphone data because in in our projects we really depend on the data that that our our clients do have. And with the, with the case that I showed you, like the actual the actual company behind that, they have really long contracts with their customers, so they get a lot of information with regards to where do they live, what is their name, um, what is their 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 buying history over years sometimes, um, and they also have a uh, let's say digitally connected product. It's not a completely digital product, but a digitally connected product. So they really get a lot of feedback from the product, how it is getting used, how often it is getting used, where it's getting used, things like that. So they really have a ton of information about that. Um, in my experience, the companies, and but I might be mistaken there, the companies that really have most uh, most data about you are tech companies, because as I said, your digital front footprint is really immense. Like I think. Probably there's no other company in the world that knows as much about you as Google. Um, uh, but apart from that, actually banking and insurance companies also have a lot of information about you because they need that in order to judge your credibility and, and your insurances and stuff like that. So they also have tons and tons of data about their, their clients, uh, their customers. Um, and then if you go into like the normal, uh, what, what, what we call fast moving consumer goods, like food or like, I don't know, electronic devices, like the retail stores that sell that to you, they really barely have any information about, about people. And um, if we do those types of projects, we always look at, okay, what, what type of data does our client actually have access to? Um, and uh, is, that actually, is that actually valuable data or is it not? And just just one fun anecdote to that, um, the 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 client that I that I that that is behind that uh, that project that I told you about, um, they actually do a, also a lot of interviews with their customers, and uh, we told them that we wanted to do the segmentation and really use their data to predict uh, their basically their choice architecture, their their needs, their their uh, their interests. And the client said, "Look, we don't need that because we already have their interests. We like a huge amount of our cust of our, our customers. We ask them about their hobbies. So when they get into contact with their customers, they ask them, okay, look, are you? Do you have any hobbies?' And then they list the hobbies that they have. And it turned out, like we we received access to that data, and it turned out that 28% um, of their customers." said that they are fishermen that they like to fish and we said we can't use that data because they did that because fishing was just in german the word for that is angeln so it's with a capital a it's just the first hobby in the list that they were able to choose from so they just like clicked anything and then to continue in the in the questionnaire mask so that's why i say like we always have to look for is the data actually valuable or not thank you there's one more question. Uh, even, there, even though personalized newsletter made about 25 euros more, was it really cost efficient, taking in consideration the amount of work that was put in the design? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was. <laughs> so like we 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 calculated a, a business case for them. They like the money that that they spent to set up everything and to build that and and all of that. They uh, in in the first. Uh, 
like in the first couple of months up to a year, I, I can't, I don't have the exact numbers in, on the top of my head right now, but, but that was basically, they, they broke even within the first year. So uh, we calculated the business case for th running it three years. They made millions with that. So that that's, it's really, it is really efficient. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay. Uh... I actually have one question for you, uh, sure. which is something was, uh, yeah, actually, um, if I take into consideration my own experience with the uh, email newsletters, which means that I barely even open them and I just like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> delete them from my mailbox without opening them. Uh, what actually makes me open the newsletter is, is the subject yeah. of the newsletter. This the first thing yeah. I see is the first thing the, the client sees. So my question is that if you use your research data also for like if you personalize also the subject because that's that is what makes the people to open the mail, yeah. right? So if you use exactly you for that as well. Yeah, exactly. But so the, the subject headline the, the subject headline is of course the, the main driver whether or not an email is getting opened. Um, and that is that is also something that we did personalize and that we tested uh, um, like how to personalize it to have the best effect. Um, uh, honestly speaking, the, um, the 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 headline personalization it had also uh, I can't exactly don't remember exactly the number of it, but it was within the range that I showed you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you said that it was within the range that you showed us. And <laughs> yeah, it was within it was within the range that we showed that I showed you. And um, for me, this the most surprising thing actually was that uh, th that like that that the subject line of the email has a huge effect is very obvious. That the content of the email has such a huge effect on top of the of the opening of it that is what actually um uh what what surprised me because i didn't think that that would have such a tremendous effect um but yeah so so the subject line we we adjusted the text adjusted we also did that's something that i'm, I'm like I, I wasn't able to fabricate that um we, we also used a lot of like techniques from behavioral economics and stuff like that within the the emailing text to further increase the effectiveness of it so there were actually a number of variables that we played with but definitely the subject line is, is one of the crucial ones very much so uh last chance uh, to ask your questions okay so it seems that we are out of questions so I would like to thank you very much for interesting lecture. I think it was it gave us very valuable information about uh, approaches to user research and uh, design. And uh, yeah, I, I I hope that yeah that <laughs> that it will we will remember these things for for the future, whether we for design users or not. Uh, OK, there is one last question. OK, one, la one last sure. question. <laughs> What's the next big thing for email marketing? Oh, <laughs> that is a tough question. Um, whew, um, I think probably I, th I think that 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 what we did here is the first step of really personalizing communication using digital means. What I didn't like, what what I did not show you because it would have been too much extra information is that the exact same approach not only can be applied to to email marketing but to all areas of digitized digitalized uh, communication basically. So it can be used for websites, it can be used for, for your apps, for, for smartphone applications, for whatever. Um, so the, um, for me, if, if we focus on email marketing, the next step probably will be what we call closing the loop. So right now what we do is we have a model that puts individuals into segments to have uh, one step in the direction of personalization. But it's actually an approach that is dumb. So it is a pre-setup approach, and then all that 
all that we're doing is we're taking like a new customer and then make a guess, okay, in which of a number of categories do you fall? And then you throw it in there and then the rest of it is automatized and it, it's just standardized and, and does all the same thing. The, the next step for me really would be to close the feedback loop. So if you send out the email and you know that there was a purchase, that that gets feedback to the to the uh, to the machine that is basically setting up those calculations, so that the mach machine itself can learn. Okay, this was successful, so I'll repeat that. This was not successful, so I'll change something. And this way, that each and every one actually gets a really personalized email. So not to this in in the sense of we have three templates and those get sent out. But if we have 100 customers, we get 100 different emails sent out. And that is something that that I know a lot of people are working on because right now with the capabilities of artificial intelligence, we are already at the level that if you have a good AI machine, you cannot differentiate human-made text from machine-made text. Um, so it will be pretty fast and pretty easy that you really get 100% individualized digital communication. And I think that will be the next next step so that everyone gets the email that that converts them the best, basically. Not sure if I'd like that, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure that yeah, will be the next step. That's an Arabic question. Um, okay, so yep. uh, there are no more questions in the chat. So uh, I would like to thank you 